green says you have plenty of time. Yellow means you need to start wrapping it up. And uh, red means finish your sentence. And, um, and, and unless there's, you know, if you're answering a question from the board, then obviously you can finish answering that question. All right. Um, you may proceed when you're ready. You want to come up to the podium so that you can, wherever you're more comfortable is fine. appeal so you're limited to the record before the grievance committee so you can't put on new evidence of um, plans or rehabilitation or anything like that so you need to confine your arguments to what's already in the record. Very well. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, any of uh, my actions would ever Thank you. 
serves a process issue, um, under your motion for new trial, you have the burden to um, set up a meritorious defense. Is there any place in the record where you established a meritorious defense in the motion for new trial?
was trained in, and that I lost about two to three years of life for that. In a certain manner, I have to say, I went down to the beginning. I did say, given a, another, another chance, um, I was born to have a seat in the field. issues presented in this matter are pretty straightforward. Did the evidentiary panel abuse its discretion in finding that Mr. Kenyatta properly served uh, pursuant to the substituted order of the evidentiary panel on December 7th? Did the panel abuse its discretion in entering the judgment of disbarment in April of last year? And did the panel abuse its discretion in denying his motion for new trial and his motion to vacate the judgment? The commission's position is that the panel did not abuse its discretion, and we are asking you to affirm those decisions. One, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the implication in the brief that was filed by Mr. Kenyatta that the that he contacted the CDC and the chief disciplinary counsel should not have filed this petition because he was he contacted them to try to work this out. The CDC has no authority or discretion at all to provide an exemption after just cause determination has been found. Rule 2.17 of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure require her to file the evidentiary petition within 60 days following the just cause determination letter and the election letter that was submitted to her. His, his contact on October 17th with part of counsel does not stop the filing of an evidentiary petition. That action is mandated on the CDC. This petition was going to have to be filed the first week of November regardless. This matter did not go before an investigatory panel to where they can negotiate a resolution. It went straight to a just cause determination. As you can see in the record, the commission attempted to personally serve him three times in November and early December of 2022. You can see the process server even indicated in her affidavit, which is on page 121 of the clerk record, that she called his office and spoke to someone who hung up on her, that she left him a voicemail on his cell phone that he did not return, and that she left her card on the door, which when she later went back to his residence, which is his preferred re residence that he's provided membership of the state bar, that her card was gone. At no time in the record will you see that Mr. Kenyatta tried to contact anybody with the Chief Disciplinary Counsel's office from October 24th to April of last year. As a result of the affidavit you can see in the clerk record on page 121, an order of substituted service was entered into by the evidentiary panel, allowing her to serve Mr. Kenyatta by posting the evidentiary petition on his door. That affidavit complies with the new version of Rule 1.06b that, that is at issue here. The, the case that he cites, Mr. Gramble, does a pretty good job of distinguishing the difference between listing an address and the affidavit of a process server versus stating that the address is a location of which a defendant can be served. And this is what the affidavit did. It listed the address, his preferred address, that he provided to the state bar membership as to where he could be located to assist the chief disciplinary counsel in executing her administrative responsibilities. You also see in the record, and it's at page 208 of the clerk record, that the commission went so far, which they were not obligated to do, to provide him personal notice of their default motion and a notice of the hearing on that default motion. That was set for April 12th. They attempted to personally give him notice on March 3rd, March 8th, and March 9th. It didn't work. So they got another order of substituted service and provided him with another copy at his door of that default motion and the notice of the hearing. He did not, he did not appear. He did not link into Zoom and appear at the default hearing. At the conclusion of that April 12th hearing, 
panel entered in order the judgment of the Spartans. That all being said, when Bishop Kenyatta filed his motion for new trial, which was heard on June 14, and at that hearing, he was required to show on the face of the record that service was not executed properly and in accordance with the evidentiary panel's order. If, in fact, service was proper, he was required to show that his not filing a timely answer to the petition was a mistake and not a result of unconscious indifference. And he had to show that he had a meritorious defense. As you can see from the reported record on the motion for new trial, the panel determined that he was properly served in accordance with their orders and that he presented no meritorious defenses. In fact, if you read the whole, the whole record, you will see not only did he not testify that he didn't receive the election notices on the underlying complaints, the only thing he testified he did not receive was the October 24th email with the original filing of the evidentiary petition. As to the response to the panel's questions as to whether he, not, he got the petition on December 7th that was left on his door, he said he firmly believed he did not receive that evidentiary petition. Mr. Kenyatta did not argue at his motion for new trial hearing that the affidavit was defective. In fact, his attorney, Mr. Lopez, only argued that he believed that the affidavit was invalid because he had not seen an order of substituted service entered by the evidentiary panel. We know that order exists. It's in the clerk record on page 129. The bottom line is Mr. Kenyatta was not able to show the evidentiary panel that he was not properly served. And to even be more clear, in the clerk record and reporter record on page 127, you can see that the address the process server went to, again, was his preferred residential address in El Paso, Texas, that he provided as required under the rule of all licensed attorneys. You can also see on page 132 of the clerk record the three attempts that were made to his residence and the fact that the process server indicated she did not receive a return call from him after she called the cell phone. Again, you will see nothing in the record that indicates at all that he tried to contact anybody after October 24th until or after April 12th. You will also see in the clerk record from pages 7 to 52 the three just cause determination letters that were sent to him with the election notices and on page 822 and 35 the delivery receipts of those emails. Now there is an argument that Mr. Kenyatta has made related to the return receipts saying no delivery of notification was sent back from the server. We get that on all the emails that get sent to him. But you can see also two weeks later, after receiving all three of those notices, he contacted George Smith, our counsel, to say he was going to discuss these complaints. It's in his motion for new trial. He attached a copy of the email to show that this was his attempt, after receiving these notices, to talk to Mr. Smith about his cases. He even testified on page 21 of the motion for new trial report record that his complete and honest understanding was that Mr. Smith and I were going to work out the matter as we had done on many prior occasions. Clerk record, page 68 through 69, you will see that the evidentiary petition that was emailed to him on that date had the same delivery receipt. And then you will also see uh, attached to the reported record for the default on Exhibit 9 and Exhibit 21, the numerous dealings uh, and disciplinary matters that have involved Mr. Kenyatta and his experience in handling evidentiary petitions and substituted service by this board and also by the Chief Disciplinary Counsel's Office. I think one of the most telling things that I saw in the record was in his brief on page 11, the August 9th brief, I'm sorry, August 8th, I think, um, an indication that the process server called him on December 5th and she filed her affidavit on December 5th. And that was just not enough time for him to respond to her phone call. But when you get to the reporter record on the motion for new trial, he says he didn't know any of this stuff was going on until April of 2023. So the question in my mind, obviously, is whether he received notice. But the fact that the process server complied with the evidentiary panel's order and the affidavit was proper 
is enough to, to show that it was a strict compliance with the rules and that process was good on December 7th. As to Mr. Kenyatta's argument in this brief related to the sanction and it being excessive, um, again, our argument is the evidence supports the judgment of disbarment that was entered by the evidentiary panel. While no doubt disbarment is severe, um, first of all, you can see from the evidence that's presented to the panel that it refutes his contention in this brief that this was primarily based on his failure to submit answers to the complete to the complaints. You can see that from the testimony from Mr. Geiger and Ms. Nelson at the default hearing that there were other violations that run through all of the other disciplinary matters that were attached to the default record. That is 103 communication, 1.15, the, unre- the non-returning of unearned fees, and 8.0487, his failure to comply with his terms of the agreements and notify his clients he was actually suspended during this period. And I'm only going to point out two rules which I believe show that the evidentiary panel did not abuse their discretion when they entered a judgment of this part. And that's 1504A and 1504B. And it deals with the guidelines under Part 15 related to the duties owed to the clients. If the panel determines that his actions were to knowingly convert the property and injure the clients, the panel can consider that as a basis for disbarment. Just at looking at Mr. Geiger's testimony alone, he paid the respondent $1,500 to represent his daughter in the juvenile matter. Mr. Kenyatta contacted the court and notified that he was going to represent his daughter. He didn't have any other contact at all with the client after that point. In fact, if you look at his testimony, he basically said that I called the office, his secretary, who we believe was his mother or a relative, told me the case was dismissed, implying that Mr. Kenyatta did the work and was entitled to the $1,500. But Mr. Geiger learned later that the case had not been dismissed, and he had to hire another attorney to go and defend his daughter in juvenile court. And he never received the $1,500 back. Just that fact alone is enough for the evidentiary panel to determine that he was knowingly converting these funds. With that, I'm going to reiterate the fact that the commission's position is that the panel did not abuse their discretion and that this board should affirm their decisions. Are there any questions?
terms of the uh, of the civil discretion, I believe the record is clear in that. I believe the record is clear in that. Let's get political the females, okay? And for, for some supplement uh, from the state, uh, which is uh, you know the typical form under the under the supplement, uh, we have a, a, a Judith Rivera stated. Mr. Smith is talking to her in email saying how, uh, how we can get service effectuated. And she goes on to say, I think it's better that you do not know that we're trying to revoke his probation since he's avoiding service. And Mr. Smith then responds, Sorry, Judith, I told him what was happening and that he needed to obtain the petition. I hope I didn't mess anything up. Now, I believe the record will show that, there's, that there are some similarities. In terms of the lacking of due process. Now, I don't want to go into how important due process is to this legal uh, profession that we have before us, but it is fundamental. It, it, it's, it's a right that's, that's um, guaranteed by the Constitution. Now, when we look at, a, at the first default, as the, as the record will show, uh, I was, uh, the process was effectuated via you know, alternate service. Sitting on, on, on the door, uh, which I stated there uh, with my permanent residence. I think it's my mother's address. I was born and raised there, although I wasn't living there at the time. Uh, I, I did maintain that to be my permanent residence as, as uh, uh, for, reason, for reasons of uh, privacy, primarily. However, I, I can say that on that first default judgment, which placed me on, within, on active suspension for three years, that was effectuated on April. April 14th, and then there was a hearing on April 29th, 15 days fall. That was my first default judgment. And that, and that at the time was deemed to be sufficient notice by the panel. 15 days. That was the first default judgment. And here we are, a, uh, an affidavit uh, that, that has no zero moment of evidence as to where, as, as to a uh, where there's probability uh, that the respondent may be hung myself, which is, which is important, you know, and, uh, and although I had actual notice, I believe uh, case laws are clear across the board uh, here in the state of Texas that uh, even actual notice to effect, to effect uh, proper service is insufficient to convey jurisdiction upon a court to render a default judgment. Mr. Cannon, was the address used um for substituted service, the address you have listed with the state That's court. That's correct, yes, Your Honor. Uh, yes, yes uh, uh, Chair. Chair Chris, and, and that is correct. I, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, negating that. However, I am stating that there was zero attempt to ascertain any location of probable finding of the respondent. And that's a requirement. The whole purpose of, of substituted service is to find an alternate, alter, alternative means of providing them. Your time is up, so if you could make any last uh, remarks in a sentence or two. Uh, uh, yes, I, I want to thank the board and thank you immensely uh, for affording me this opportunity. I can tell you that uh, the errors and judgments that were made uh, won't happen again uh, through their services that I have in place afforded to me uh, as a blessing. Uh, I, I am firm that any uh, judgment uh, is in fact void due to the insufficiency of, of process. Take this case under advisement, and we wish you the best in your continued journey.